I'm glad that you're with us this morning. Um, if you have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, we're going to be right at the end of James chapter 1, right at the beginning of James chapter 2 this morning. And so I think you'll be served best if you can put that in front of you. And I'll meet you there in just a couple of moments. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple things as we kind of get going this morning. Um, first of all, I know that uh, the average age in the room is a little bit younger today than it is on a typical Sunday morning here. This is a family worship weekend here at Life Church, and so we're glad to have elementary age kids in the room with us. Um, kids, if, if, if that's you, right, if you are under the age of 12 and you're in the room, would you just put your hand in the air for me real fast? Seriously, proudly, boldly, yeah, Declan, I appreciate him shoving his 10-month-old hand up in the air right now. That's brilliant. Okay, kids, I just want you to listen for a second. You can put your hands down, um, but let me talk to you for a minute about what's about to happen here. Um, and I do this because you're going to listen to me this morning talk for 35 minutes or so, and I realize that you might think, because I'm going to stand right here and talk, that we think that what I have to say is really important this morning. But I just want to clarify for you and for your parents too, because sometimes they're prone to forget. Um, what I have to say isn't important, and nobody here thinks that what I have to say is important. What we think is important is what God has to say. And happily, fortunately, by grace, we know what God has said through the Bible, through his holy word. And so you can see, kids, my Bible hanging over the edge of the pulpit right here. I always put it right there. I could put it lower, but I put it right there just so that everybody can see it so that everybody knows that this is really what matters this morning in this 35 minutes that I have with you. And so you're going to listen to me talk, but realize we're listening to me talk just so that we can hear what God has said this morning. And the only reason I'm going to do what I'm going to do is because it's my job to explain to us what God has said through his word. And so that's the main thing today. Kids, you got it? You with me on that? Cool. Awesome. Um, I hope you will help me keep your parents in line today. If they start to like get a little fidgety or a little wiggly, if they start to talk to their neighbor, you know, it's your job to just kind of elbow them so that they don't do that. All right, number two, um, we always uh, wrestle as a, as a church, um, the leadership of our church, we kind of wrestle anytime something really like pronounced and significant happens in our world, in our culture, like during the week before we gather. You know, one of the things that we, we we, we debate is like how much we speak to what happens in a given week when we gather as God's people on Sunday morning. The truth is that we see tragedy and injustice every week, right? And so if we were intent on responding to every tragedy and every injustice, we would respond every week to something new, multiple times, something new every single week. Um, and so obviously, we're not going to just like be tossed about by the wind of what's happening um, but we also, at the same time this week, would acknowledge that the tragedy we have learned unfolded in Uvalde, Texas, like it strikes our hearts in a different way, um, especially given the fact that, you know, we're gathering in this room uh, with elementary age kids with us, like to think about those elementary age kids not coming home from school one day because of the kind of thing that happened in Uvalde this week, um, that tugs at us. Um, it causes us to mourn. It causes us to protest against the ongoing effects of sin and death in this world. Right? It causes us to protest against the forces of evil that are muzzled by the Lord but still unleashed in this world. And so I wanted us just to, to take a minute before we dive into James 1 and 2 this morning um, to acknowledge the grief that we feel um, and to pray really a prayer of lament in response to what's happened and on behalf of those who are suffering in Texas as a result of what's happened. And so let's take a moment this morning. I know we've prayed several times already by this point in our gathering, but let's take a moment just to pray particularly um, for those who are hurt and suffering and full of sorrow in light of the tragedy in Uvalde. Pray with me, church. Jesus, we praise you today because you are a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. There is no sorrow that any person will encounter in this world that you do not know. Your ears are not deaf to our cries. Your eyes are not blind to our pain. More than that, you don't 
just know these things. You've experienced these things yourself. And so we are grateful today for a Lord and a Savior um, who knows our need, who knows our pain. We pray, Lord, for those who are affected and afflicted by the tragedy in Texas this week. We pray that you uh, will bring comfort to those whose lives have just been broken in a million pieces. And we pray that you will help your church surrounding those people to lift high before them uh, the living hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the hope that we have that there will one day be an everlasting city where there is no weeping, nor mourning, nor sorrow, nor pain. Comfort all of us with the vision of that city today. We pray that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, let's get started. In James 1, we're going to start in verse 26 and 27. These last two verses of James 1 are essentially kind of a recap of where we've been so far in the book of James, and they're also really a bridge to what comes in chapter 2. So I'm going to spend just a minute in these two verses, and then we're going to walk into chapter 2 together. But let me read James 1, 26 and 27 to start. James writes, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, when James uses this word religion, he uses it to mean something very different than what Christians in our culture typically mean by the word religion. Right, it's pretty common for Christians in our culture to say something like, Christianity is all about a relationship, not a religion. And by that we mean that Christianity is not a system of laws and rules that one keeps in order to be saved. Right, Christianity is not a situation where one can earn their place in the family of God by their obedience to a particular set of commandments. And Christianity isn't a system of rituals that one must keep in order to purify oneself and make oneself holy. That's what we typically mean when we say that Christianity is not a religion. Instead, it's about a relationship, a living, vibrant, active relationship with Jesus. And that is all true. But when James talks about religion that is pure and undefiled, he doesn't mean religion the way that we talk about it. Really, he means something like a genuine, sincere faith in the Lord Jesus. Not obedience to commands that will save you, but obedience to a Lord, because as Lord Jesus gives commands. See, that's one of the things that James, the author of the book of James, never shies away from, right? Though Christianity is a religion in which we are saved by grace through faith, James will not let us forget the fact that the Lord who has saved us is a Lord who makes commands. James is not opposed to obedience. He's opposed to earning salvation through obedience, He's not opposed to Christians following the laws of God. He's opposed to thinking that your place in the family of God is contingent upon your obedience to the laws of God. But when James talks about this idea of religion, he's simply pointing to the fact that King Jesus as king makes commands. And that as followers of King Jesus, we should be people whose lives are characterized by obedience to those commands. But there's another thing that we need to recognize about these commands that King Jesus makes. Every time Jesus makes commands, that command is equal part command and invitation. In other words, when Jesus commands something, he's inviting us to a kind of life or to a way of life. He's inviting us to follow him on the path to fullness of life and to joy. See, the thing that the Bible lays before us again and again and again is the fact that Jesus knows far better than we do the way our lives ought to go. Jesus knows far better than we do what will really make us happy, what will bring, really bring us fullness in life. And so the kind of religion that James talks about here, it's that kind of obedience 
the kind of obedience that follows Jesus on the path to fullness of life. Now, here in verses 26 and 27, he says that that path leads to a couple of places. Verse 26, he says that we can obey Jesus by bridling our tongue, right? If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he's deceiving his heart and his religion is worthless. Now, we're going to talk a lot about what James has to say about our tongues in chapter 3, so we're going to move on for now. But look at verse 27. He adds again, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, Bible scholars recognize that really James here, he's riffing on the teaching of his half-brother Jesus. It was Jesus who told us that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And James would simply add that if you love the Lord that way, you will not be deceived or tempted into thinking that what the world offers you is better than what the Lord offers you, and you will keep yourself unstained from the world. And then Jesus adds, too, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And James would clarify, love your neighbor, especially those who are poor and vulnerable, like orphans and widows in their affliction. And so in verse 27 here, James is really summarizing the teaching of Jesus. And then into chapter two, he starts to apply that teaching of Jesus. And he applies it particularly to the sin of partiality. That's what we're gonna look at today. And what I hope to do is, I hope it's very simple. Like I'm gonna talk about really three big things from James 2, 1 through 13. First, we're gonna talk about what we must avoid. And then second, why we must avoid it, and then third, what we must do instead. So that's the outline of where we're headed. What we must avoid, why we must avoid it, what we must do instead. So let's start with what we must avoid. Read with me in verse one of chapter two. James says, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Show no partiality, James writes. What does that mean? Well, positively, it means show no favoritism. Right? Don't play favorites. Don't favor anyone because of their race or their skin color or their socioeconomic status. Don't favor anyone because of their educational background or their gender or their political affiliation. Show no favoritism. That's what that means positively. Negatively, it means don't discriminate. Show no discrimination based on someone's race or skin color or socioeconomic status or educational background or gender or political affiliation. No favoritism, no discrimination. That's what James means when he says show no partiality. And then in verses two through four, James illustrates what partiality looks like. He says... For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you, sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you, stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Get this picture in your mind, will you? Right, James is talking about the assembly. That means the gathering of God's people on the Lord's day to worship him. And he says, imagine that two brothers roll into the assembly at the same time. One is clearly, obviously loaded. Right? His European luxury car is in the parking lot. He's wearing nice clothes, Rolex. The $50 bills are like falling out of his pocket because he has so many of them that they don't fit into his pocket, right? And he comes in and everybody recognizes him and sees that this is a dude who has some clout, right? They recognize that this is somebody who's special who has come to visit them. And so everybody's trying to like get close to him and talk to him and greet him. Maybe he's like a local celebrity of some kind. So everybody wants to sit near him and he's received warmly and brought to the place of honor in the assembly. The other dude who rolls in at the same time, well, let's just say that you can smell him before you can see him, right? He has not bathed in a while. 
His clothes have not bathed in a longer while. If you can call them clothes at all, frankly, they're more like rags. And when he wanders into the building, somebody says to him, you know, maybe you would be more comfortable in the lobby, which is code for, are you sure you really belong here at all? Now, the, th- the truth is that when we think about this illustration, right, that James provides for us, when we think about making distinctions between people rich and poor like James lays out, I mean, we agree quickly with him that to make distinctions among yourselves like that, verse 4, means that you are judges with evil thoughts. That's partiality. We would agree with James that that's wicked and evil and that it has no place among God's people. But here's the thing. Most of us, I think probably all of us, though we're likely to say that we should reject and despise the kind of open discrimination that James lays out here, like his illustration, it doesn't have much teeth for us because we would never openly and brazenly treat people differently because of their economic reality. We wouldn't openly and brazenly treat people differently because of their gender or because of their race or because of their education or because of their background. Most of us, I think all of us would say that partiality like this that James is illustrating here is evil and wicked. We think, yeah, of course, James, that's wrong. But church, don't you think that the Christians James was writing to would have said the exact same thing? Don't you think they would have been just as likely as us to despise the kind of partiality that James illustrates here. Which means that James thinks that even people who would intellectually oppose partiality need to be reminded to show no partiality. And I think experience can confirm that if we're honest. Right, talk to anybody who comes from an ethnic minority background and that person from an ethnic minority background has stories, right? Stories about times when people have shown them partiality, when they favored other people, when they've discriminated against them. They've been on the receiving end of the kind of discriminatory partiality that James is talking about here. And if we're honest, that's not just a problem out there in the world, right? It's a problem in here in the church too. It's a problem in our hearts too. Right, I don't know, just as an example, I don't know a single female ministry leader in vocational ministry who hasn't at some point in her life felt like she was left out in the cold because she didn't fit into the boys club that characterizes many church leadership circles. Right, so sisters who are sincere in their desire to serve the Lord and bless others through their ministry, on the receiving end of partiality, not from non-Christians, and not even just from like average church folk, often from church leaders, simply because of their gender. Now I say those things, like we are, we are openly and, and boldly complementarian here at Life Church. If you don't know what that means, it simply means that we believe that according to the Bible, that God has wired men and women differently, that he treats them equally in terms of value and worth and dignity, but that he's given them distinct roles in the family and in the church. And so there are, there are places where, where women don't go here because of our convictions. But that's not permission like to show partiality, to discriminate against women, which is something that that happens, frankly, quite often in church circles, church circles like ours. And so what I'm getting at is the fact that the kind of partiality that James describes here, right, it's far more subtle than we're likely to realize. Like it gets in beneath the surface. It can be like, the air we breathe or the water that we swim in. Do you remember the story about the fishes? I've told this before, and it's not mine. It's not original to me. This is from David Foster Wallace, an American novelist. He said, imagine one day that there are two young fish swimming through the ocean, and they pass this old crotchety fish who's swimming past them. And that old crotchety fish, as he passes them, he, he looks at him and he just says, how's the water today, boys? And the two young fish, they swim past the old fish, and one looks to the other and says, what in the world is water? Right, the idea is that when you're immersed in something, you don't even know you're immersed in it. And that's how partiality works 
among us. It can be like the air we breathe. And so we have to learn to identify it, and we have to learn to avoid it. What must we avoid? No partiality. Why must we avoid it? That's the second thing that James deals with here. He actually gives us three reasons. First, he says, partiality ignores the gospel. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse five. He says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? What James is saying here is that it is actually unchristian to favor the rich over the poor because God is calling out a people for himself and for reasons that only he knows, the people he is calling out for himself overwhelmingly come from those who are poor, not from those who are rich. Or to put that another way, Christ's church is full of the weak and the impoverished far more than it is full of the rich and the powerful. God's people are, by God's design, a bunch of nobodies in the world's eyes, not a bunch of somebodies. That's the way the gospel works, James is saying. It's the way God works. Now, that's the opposite of the way the world works, of course. I can illustrate that a number of ways, but because there are kids in the room, I'll do this one. Um, Kids, raise your hand again. Seriously, under the age of 12, put it in the air like you really don't care. Great, thank you. Um, So kids, if if you today want to play sports, here's how that works for you, right? You beg mom and dad to let you sign up for sports. They sign you up for a team in a league. That league has rules, it has referees, and when you play games, it has parents who are yelling at those referees, right? And that's really like the only way youth sports happens today. Now, if you reverse back into ancient history when I was a child 30 years ago, right? If you wanted to play sports 30 years ago, generally speaking, here's how that worked. You found a ball, and you found a bunch of other kids, and you found a field, and you just played sports, right? Like all you needed for sports to happen 30 years ago was time and space and enough friends to play those sports with you. And you'd show up at that field at a given time during the summer, and you'd have your ball, and everybody would be ready to play, and then you'd have to pick teams. And you know how you'd pick teams? Like the two biggest, fastest, tallest, strongest kids on the field would be the team captains. And they would take turns alternating the people that they wanted on their teams. And so the biggest, tallest, fastest, strongest kid, he'd be captain number one. Captain number two would go second. Captain number one would go first. Captain number one would look at all of the remaining kids that weren't a captain, and he would pick the biggest, fastest, tallest, strongest kid who was remaining, and he would say, I want that person on my team. And then captain number two would look at the field and he'd say, he'd see the biggest, fastest, tallest, strongest remaining kid and he'd pick that person and he'd want him to be on his team. And they'd just go back and forth, back and forth until you got to the very end when it was the kid with two broken arms and me. (laughs) And for reasons that I'm still bitter about, often the captain would feel sorry for the kid with two broken arms and pick him ahead of me. But don't worry, I'm talking to my counselor about all of that. Um, Anyway, my point is that like if you wanted to win the game, then obviously you picked the biggest, fastest, tallest, strongest kids on the field, right? And you wanted to have nothing to do with the people who were obviously weak and uncoordinated and awkward and unathletic. And that's just how it worked, right? If you wanted to play and you wanted to win, you chose the people who were obviously strong and powerful. But James's point, and my point to you today, is that is not how God picks his people. Right? That is not how God works. When God forms a people, he looks for the weak people. He looks for the broken people. He looks for the nobodies. In fact, he sent his son Jesus into the earth as a nobody so that he could save a bunch of nobodies. Right? People who knew that they were sinners in need of a savior. God didn't send Jesus to take strong people and clean them up a little bit and make them stronger. No, he sent Jesus to take a whole bunch of broken, messed up, weak people and make them new. And when he did that, he went completely against the grain of the way the world works. Here's how the Apostle Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians 1. And friends, I think it's amazing that Paul says this because there was a point in time in Paul's life when Paul was a somebody, 
right, when all of his identity was wrapped up in the fact that he had a resume that, was, that he was proud of. But he says this in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 1. He says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Brothers, sisters, if you're a Christian today, God didn't save you because you were awesome. He saved you because he is awesome. In fact, he saved you and all of your weak, pathetic, broken nobodiness so that everyone would see that he is awesome in the process of saving a people who are a bunch of weak, pathetic, broken nobodies. This is why partiality is despicable to God. Because when we start treating people who are somebody better than people who are nobody, We're ignoring the way that God has worked in our lives to save us. James says, has not God chosen those who were poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? We can't favor people that we think are somebody when God has set his affection on us when we were nobody. Now I want to stop right here and just ask you to think about your own heart for a minute. I mean, think about the way that you treat other people. Think about the factors that influence the way that you treat other people. Do you treat people differently based on what they've accomplished? Do you treat successful people better than people who clearly struggle to have their act together? Do you prefer to spend time with people who have made something of themselves? Do you avoid spending time with people who the world thinks are nobody? That's partiality. Here's the second reason why we must avoid partiality, James says. He says partiality dishonors people. So it doesn't just dishonor God and the way that God works. It dishonors people people. Specifically, it dishonors those who are discriminated against, even though they're bearers of God's image. Look at verses 6 and 7. James says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? Now, In these two verses, I think it's pretty clear that there's something going on in the churches that James is writing to, right? The Christians in those churches are tempted to to favor the rich, which is stupid because the rich are actually like blaspheming in the name of God and suing them. We don't really know all of those details, but I want us to focus on the first part of verse six because that's the point that I'm trying to make here. What's going on when you show partiality? James says, you have dishonored the poor man. Even though the poor are bearers of God's image, just like you, just like me, partiality treats them like they are worthless, like they're second-class citizens. Now, every person is a bearer of God's image, right? That's true regardless of our occupation or our wealth or our skin color. Every person created in the image of God bears equal worth and value and dignity because of our creator and the image that he has bestowed upon us. But partiality says that something outside of us, right, some external reality beyond the fact that we bear God's image, something like your bank account or your background or your political affiliation. Partiality says that those things matter more than God's image inside of you and treats people differently based on those external things rather than the internal reality of God's image. That's why partiality dishonors people because it values something more than and above what God values. One question that's worth wrestling with here. Why do we instinctively and intuitively favor the rich 
over the poor. Why, if all things were equal, would we prefer to spend time with someone who is wealthy over someone who isn't? Or with someone who has their act together over someone who doesn't? Like in the end, I think for most of us, it boils down to what we believe we can get out of the relationship. Instinctively, intuitively, we know that if we're in a relationship with a rich person, then that's gonna benefit us. We might get some social status, we might get some clout, Maybe some of the $50 bills are going to fall out of their pocket and we'll be there to pick them up, right? We, we think that we're going to benefit from being close and in proximity to people who are wealthy and to people who have power. And then the opposite is true. We avoid relationships with people who seem like they're a mess. We avoid relationships with people who are clearly poor because we sense that those relationships are just going to take and take and take from us. We sense that those relationships are going to demand from us and never offer anything to us. It's going to be all give and no take. And we don't want to have anything to do with that. But friends, that's partiality. It dishonors people because it looks at people as something to be consumed rather than as a bearer of God's image to be honored. It's the third reason why we must show no partiality James says that partiality is rebellion against God. Look with me now at verse 8. James says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, and he quotes the royal law, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now, the law that James is quoting here is from Leviticus chapter 19, it's actually the same law that he was reflecting on at the end of chapter one when he talked about religion that is pure and undefiled. James calls it the royal law. What James is saying is that partiality violates God's royal law because when you discriminate, you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, right? You're choosing who to love and you're being very unloving to the people that you are discriminating against. And then James adds that even if you're very good at keeping most of God's law, you're guilty of breaking all of it if you break even one bit. That's the point he makes in verse 10. He says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, one of our great errors is the fact that we believe that good behavior in one area can cancel out bad behavior in another. We think that if we keep certain laws, then it's okay if we violate other laws. In other words, we tolerate partiality because partiality isn't nearly as bad as murder or adultery. But the thing is, we know that deep inside, That's broken, that's not logical, that's not true. Right, imagine for a moment that you were sitting on a jury. Now I've only had once in my life jury duty that like got to the point where I actually like sat on a jury in like a very small like traffic incident. I was disappointed that it was nothing like what I'd seen on TV. It's really kind of a letdown. Um, now, nowadays, all I have to do is mention that I'm a pastor and I get disqualified from jury duty like immediately. And so that's one benefit of my occupation. But imagine that all of us, we were sitting on a jury for a minute and that it was a lot like what you see on TV. Right, there's a trial somebody's accused of committing murder, and there's just a ton of evidence that confirms that this dude did it, right? You've got eyewitness testimony, there's DNA evidence, and there are all these circumstantial pieces that put the uh, defendant at the place of the crime at the time of the crime. Maybe you even have like people who were live streaming the, the crime on their smartphones as it was happening, right? So you've got like all of this evidence against the defendant. He practically even admits to having done it during cross-examination. And so let's imagine that there's just this mountain of evidence against the guy for the fact that he's committed murder, and then right at the last minute before, you know, the jury is about to render its verdict, he says, hold on, I have one more thing to say in my defense. And you can imagine, like, the courtroom hushing, the defendant's going to speak it again. And then imagine he says, okay, I did it. I committed murder. 
but you should acquit me because I've never committed adultery. I've been faithful to my wife. I've been loyal to her. I've never cheated on her. You should acquit me. Now, you don't have to be Perry Mason to see that that's not going to work in court, right? That's not going to hold up under the logic of the law. Like, if you're guilty of breaking the law, you're guilty of breaking the law. And no amount of obedience to other laws is going to make you innocent of breaking the law. And that's because, in the case of the Bible, the same lawgiver stands behind all of the laws, The God who says you shall not murder is the God who says you shall not commit adultery is the God who says you shall not show partiality. And so any failure to obey any one of those commands is rebellious against the lawgiver. And as we think about this, we should realize that one of the reasons why partiality can lurk subtly in our hearts is because it just doesn't seem like that big of a deal to us. It's not murder. It's not adultery. So why should we get all flared up about it? But church, the same lawgiver stands behind all of the laws. Partiality is rebellion just like murder and just like adultery. It offends the holy and righteous king of heaven just like murder and just like adultery. It's the third and final reason why we must show No partiality, because partiality is rebellion against our God. What must we not do? Why must we not do it? What must we do instead? It's the third thing this morning. How should we relate to other people? If not partiality, then what? It's the final issue in our passage. Look at verses 12 and 13. James says, so speak... And so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Here's my summary of what James is saying there. He's saying, live like there's a day coming when God will judge the living and the dead. So speak and so act as to prepare yourself to give an account to the God who will judge the living and the dead. Church, all Christians are saved by grace through faith that comes to us as free as free can be. Jesus has paid the entire price of our salvation. There's no penalty left to be satisfied. There's no price left to be paid. But all Christians who have truly been saved will strive to keep God's law. We will strive to so speak and so act as if to be ready for the day when God will judge the living and the dead. In particular, that means we're going to show mercy to other people, right? We've received mercy, and so we're going to show mercy. That won't be something we should do. That's something that we will do if we truly know Jesus. And so rather than looking at people and thinking, what can I get from you? How can I benefit from this relationship? We're to look to people and say, how can I be merciful to you? How can that mercy overflow in kindness in our relationship with one another? And what James is really telling us is that the way that we treat others It's actually a test that reveals the degree to which we've understood the gospel. It's a test that reveals whether or not we're really Christians, which means that your eternal soul hangs in the balance as you think about the questions, how and where do you show partiality? How and where do you need to repent of partiality? My wife, Kristen, lost her mother when uh, she was 28 years old. Uh, Marcy, my mother-in-law, died when she was in her early 50s. She lost her second of two battles um, with cancer. She won the first battle when my wife was a teenager, but um, the second one was too much. Um, Within a year of her second cancer diagnosis, the cancer had metastasized, and she reached stage four, and... You know, in the end, she went pretty quickly. Um, It was early from our perspective, right? She was young, 
we were young. Um, Marcy never got to meet the granddaughter that we named after her. Um, she only met in the flesh two of her six living grandchildren, um, and none of those living grandchildren have any real memory of her because she was so young and they were so young when she passed. Um, our family misses her. We miss Marcy. Uh, but because of her mom's cancer history and because of like the particular forms of cancer that her mom struggled with, um, doctors have just told us for years that Kristen is medium to high risk for the same kinds of cancer herself. Um, honestly, like I, when I think about cancer and Kristen, I just think it's a when, not if sort of thing. That's just how I prepare myself mentally for that. Um, and as a result, like Chris is super vigilant. Um, she's super vigilant about the annual scans in particular. She just got the call like a couple weeks ago that it's time for the scan this year. And uh, she never skips that, right? She never skips the appointment. She makes the phone call. She goes in, she gets the scan, and then we just pray and wait until they call us and tell us that there's nothing to worry about. All the while preparing ourselves for the day, the day that we hope never comes, the day that we pray never comes, the day when they call and they say, well, you need to come in because we need to talk to you about some things. And as much as like, I kind of like have this pit in the pit of my stomach, like this, this like gnawing feeling when I think about the fact that that phone call might happen. I know at the end of the day, if that phone call happens, if that phone call happens, they call us and they say, hey, we've seen something, you need to come in so we can chat. Like I know in that moment, though I might not feel it, that the scan is actually a gift from the Lord, right? Because it will have identified things that we need to do it will have alerted us to warning signs, to dangers. It will launch us on a journey of you know, attacking and doing everything that we can to get rid of that cancer in my wife's body should it one day come. Church, I pray that today, God's word would be like that scan to your heart. I pray that the sin of partiality would be like that scan to your heart showing you, all right, here's what we didn't want to see, but now here's what we're going to do to treat it. How do you treat people who don't look like you, who don't think like you, who don't talk like you, who don't act like you? How do you treat people with different beliefs? How do you treat people from different backgrounds? How do you respond to people who don't have anything to offer you? People who might, in the end, only be demanding of your time and your energy? How do you treat people who don't live the way that you live, who don't vote the way that you vote, who don't act the way that you act? Let your answers to those questions be the scan that reveals whether or not your religion is true and genuine or a deadly counterfeit for the real thing. Let's pray together. God, help us to see ourselves as we should. Expose in our hearts the partiality that lurks and lingers in the places that we would prefer to imagine don't exist at all. Give us eyes to see the truth about who we are. And then give us eyes to see the truth about who you are. Give us eyes to see the staggering and spectacular grace that you've shown us, not because we deserved it, not because we benefit you in some way, not because there is something in us that caused us to like measure up to your standard. No, help us to see the fact that you have shown us your grace because you are gracious. And because of your great mercy, God, may we praise you for causing us to be born again to a living hope pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If we were honest, every one of us would admit that we always prefer to be with people who think like we do.